two months ago, I did a video on 10 famous crowns from Europe. Well, today, based on popular demand, I'm going to do one on 10 famous crowns from Asia. I've chosen a variety of crowns from different regions and different time periods, and this time I'm simply going to go through them from east to west. So, let's get to it. The first crown I'm going to talk about isn't really a crown per se. Rather, it's a type of traditional headwear worn by the Japanese emperor. It's called a kanmuri, and it's just one part of the elaborate male court attire called the sokotai. Nowadays, the sokotai and its female counterpart, the junihito, are rarely worn. The only time you're likely to see someone wearing the full attire is at an imperial wedding or the enthronement ceremony of a new emperor. But over the centuries, the traditional cap, the kanmuri, has been worn by many different types of people. In addition to emperors and the immediate members of the imperial court, it was also worn by Shinto priests, shoguns, samurai warriors, and in certain circumstances, even everyday folk. You can see from this diagram that the kanmori consists of three main parts, along with a hairpin. The most distinctive part is the long, flat piece that is either bent so that it drapes down the back or made so that it sticks straight up. Although different materials have been used over time, the basic design is over 1,000 years old and originated during the Heian period of Japanese history. Let's now take a look at a Korean crown. This is just one of several crowns that still exist from the Three Kingdoms period, which means that it's approximately 1,500 years old. Back then, there were three main kingdoms on the southern Korean peninsula, named Bakje, Shila, and Gaia. Each had its own unique style of crown, and none of them appear to be influenced by Chinese designs. The one I've chosen to highlight is from the kingdom of Shilla. It is known as the gold crown from the great tomb of Huang Nam. However, please note that Huang Nam is not the name of the king who wore the crown. Rather, Huang Nam is simply the name of the neighborhood in the former Shilla capital city of Gyeongju, where the tomb was found. It is actually not known which king or queen it belonged to. As the name suggests, the crown is made of solid gold, but it also has 77 pieces of jade hanging from it. In the front are three tridents, which could have been chosen because the trident is the Chinese letter for mountain, but this is not certain. On the sides are two protrusions that kind of look like antlers, and hanging from the bottom are six long chains called suhasik. In the same tomb, but in a different location, researchers also found a cap like this, which might have been worn underneath the main crown, or might have been a crown used separately. Either way, some experts think that the gold on the main crown was too thin to have been worn by a living monarch, and may actually have been purposefully designed as a burial crown. We now come to the dominant force in East Asia for most of history. China. Of course, many different dynasties have ruled China over the last 4,000 years, and therefore there were many different styles of dress used by its emperors. But perhaps the headwear most associated with Chinese emperors is the Mianguan, a flat mortarboard with several strands of beads hanging off it. This type of imperial headwear has its roots in the Han Dynasty, which was roughly contemporaneous with the Roman Empire and was a golden age for China. Because much of Chinese culture is rooted in this important time period, the Mianguan continued to be used, at least in some ceremonial settings, all the way up until the Ming Dynasty, 
and it was also even retroactively incorporated into images of Chinese rulers from before the Han Dynasty. A couple things to note about the Mianguan. First, the beads hung on the front and the back, not on the sides. This served to both obscure the emperor's eyes and to demonstrate the emperor's graceful poise. Second, the emperor was not the only person to wear a Mianguan. You can tell who a Mianguan belonged to by counting how many beads are attached to each string. If there are 12, then it's the emperor's Mianguan. If there are less than 12, it belonged to a prince or a lesser noble. Moving on to Southeast Asia, this is the crown of Selangor, which is one of the states within Malaysia. Malaysia actually has a very interesting form of monarchy. Within Malaysia, there are actually nine monarchs, most of them sultans. Every five years, one of the nine monarchs is elected to serve as the Yang di Pertuan Agog, which is kind of like a supreme king for all of Malaysia. In reality, though, the voting is actually ceremonial, and the nine monarchs usually just rotate according to an already established order. The current supreme king is Sultan Abdullah of Pahang. However, another one of the sultans in Malaysia is Sultan Sharafuddin of Selangor. Selangor being the largest state in Malaysia in terms of population, and this is the official crown of Selangor. However, like most crowns, it is only worn for special occasions, such as a coronation. As you can see, it is covered with many diamonds, and its most notable feature is the feather-like protrusion on the top. You can also see that the design incorporates a crescent moon. Malaysia is a predominantly Muslim country, and of course the crescent moon is the main symbol for Islam. Another Asian country that is still a monarchy today is Thailand. And Thailand has a very distinctive crown, known as the Great Crown of Victory. It has a conical shape with a very tall pointy top. In Thailand, this type of headgear is called a mongkut, and it is also worn by performers doing traditional dances. The cone part of the Great Crown of Victory is over two feet tall, that's 60 centimeters, but it also has two side pieces that hang down over the ears. Altogether, it weighs a whopping 7 kilograms. That's over 15 pounds. The main part of the crown, which is made of gold and enamel, is about 240 years old, having been made for the first Chakri king of Thailand, Rama I. However, during the reign of Rama IV, Many diamonds were added, including a huge diamond on the very top. And now for something completely different. The smallest monarchy in Asia today, in terms of population, is the Kingdom of Bhutan, located in the Himalayan mountains between China and India. The official crown of Bhutan is unique in that, rather than being made of metal, like most crowns today, it is made of satin and silk. The reigning dynasty in Bhutan, the House of Wangchuk, is also one of the youngest royal dynasties in the world, and therefore the history of this crown only goes back about 100 years. The raven was chosen as it is the national bird of Bhutan, and it is associated with the guardian deity of Bhutan, who is named Mahakala. Near Bhutan is another Himalayan country, known as Nepal. Today, Nepal is a federal republic, but up until 2008, it was a monarchy, and this was its crown. Unlike Bhutan's crown, it is covered in over 2,000 pearls, 730 diamonds, and several other precious stones. However, its most distinctive feature is the bundle of feathers, which protrude from the top and then hang down the back. 
These feathers come from a rare bird known as the bird of paradise, after which the more well-known bird of paradise flower was named. Nowadays, the former monarchy of Nepal is mostly associated with the 2001 Nepalese royal massacre, an event that left the king and nine other members of the royal family dead. Strangely, the killer was not some crazed member of the general public, but rather the crown prince. On June the 1st, 2001, during a party at the royal palace, Crown Prince Dipendra shot and killed his father, mother, brother, sister, two uncles, two aunts, a cousin, and a security chief, before then turning the gun on himself and committing suicide. Another strange thing about the event is that the killer actually lived for three days in a coma, during which time he officially succeeded his father as king. Upon his death, his uncle Gyanendra became king and ended up being the last king of Nepal, the monarchy being disestablished seven years later. While we're talking about Nepal, let me show you another Nepalese crown. This one is much older, going back about 750 years, making it one of the oldest surviving crowns from the region. We now come to India. As I've mentioned several times on this channel, India, throughout most of its history, was not a single unified state. Instead, it was comprised of many small kingdoms and principalities, sometimes ruled independently and sometimes forming part of a larger empire. Because of this, there are many different crowns and other types of royal headwear that I could show you for India. What I've chosen to show you is the crown of Bahadur Shah II, the last Mughal emperor. Being that the Mughal Empire was one of the richest empires in all of world history, you might have expected to see something more impressive. Although, don't get me wrong, this crown is probably worth more than what most of us will make in a lifetime. But compared to some of the European crowns we looked at in my previous video, I think you get my point. Well, there are two reasons why this crown is comparatively rather basic. First of all, by the time Bahadur Shah II reigned, the Mughal Empire was just a small shadow of what it had once been. The emperor was just a figurehead by then, and his territory was basically limited to the city of Delhi. But second, and more important, is the fact that owning a physical crown to place on the head of one's monarch was simply not as important to certain cultures as it was to certain other cultures. When it comes down to it, wearing a piece of metal on one's head with a bunch of jewels on it has always been more of a European thing. That's why the ancient Chinese and Japanese headwear that we looked at were so very different. Sure, lots of countries around the world eventually adopted metal crowns loaded up with jewels, but in most cases that occurred because of European influence. However, that doesn't mean that the rulers of non-European monarchies, such as the Mughal emperors, didn't like showing off their incredible wealth. In the Mughal case, they simply put all of their fancy jewels into a throne, called the Peacock Throne, rather than into a crown. When you think about it, that's actually much more impressive. Sadly, the Peacock Throne no longer exists, having been captured and looted by Nadir Shah of Persia in 1739. However, several of the jewels that were once part of the Peacock Throne do. These include the pink daria e -Nur diamond, which is now in the possession of Iran, and the Shah diamond, which is now in the possession of Russia. But perhaps the two most important pieces of the Peacock Throne were the Kohinoor diamond and the Timur ruby. These two stones were originally captured by Nadir Shah, but then his grandson ended up trading them to Ahmad Shah Durrani, founder of the Afghan Empire, in exchange for support. But then, in turn, 
Ahmad's grandson ended up having to trade the stones to Ranjit Singh, founder of the Sikh Empire. Again, because the one ruler helped the other in time of need. But the trail doesn't end there. Following the Anglo-Sikh Wars, the stone ended up in the possession of the British Empire, where today they are a part of the British crown jewels, a fact that angers many people in both India and Pakistan. There have been many attempts to repatriate the stones back to the subcontinent, but so far none of them have been successful. To add insult to injury, guess who also has the crown of the last Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah II? Yep, the Brits. In our journey across the continent of Asia from east to west, we now come to the Middle East. Currently, of the 14 monarchies that still exist in Asia, half of them are in the Middle East. But out of these seven Middle Eastern monarchies, the total number that have physical crowns is zero. All seven of the Middle Eastern monarchies are in Arabic countries. And like I said earlier, different cultures have different customs. And in Arabic monarchies, physical crowns are simply not a thing. So the last two crowns that we're going to look at are from former Middle Eastern monarchies. The first is the Kiana crown, used by the Qajar dynasty, which ruled Iran up until 1925. This impressive crown is actually made of red velvet, but is set with thousands of gems, which give it its shape. In total, there are at least 1,800 pearls, over a thousand rubies and spinels, and approximately 300 emeralds. The total height, not counting the elaborate flourish on the very top, is about 32 centimeters, or one foot. If you want to take a look at this amazing crown, it's currently on display at the Treasury of National Jewels in Tehran, along with the Darya i Noor I mentioned earlier, and the more recent Pahlavi crown. The final crown was probably the most impressive crown of all, but unfortunately, no one knows exactly what it looked like. It belonged to Suleiman the Magnificent, considered by most historians to have been the greatest of the various Ottoman sultans. Now, as a sultan, Suleiman would have primarily worn a turban, not a crown. So it is thought that he probably had this made just to impress and intimidate the nearby Europeans. You'll notice that it looks a lot like the papal tiaras worn by popes. And this is actually on purpose. Papal tiaras always have three levels. But as you can see, Suleiman's crown had four. This was his way of saying that he outranked everyone, even the Pope. Okay, so that was a look at some famous crowns from Asia. Let me know in the comments which one you liked the best, and whether or not I left one out that you feel I should have shown. Thanks for watching.